I was in Cooperstown where I picked up a copy of Baseball in the Garden of Eden, the definitive account of the game's origins, and one particular line struck me. In discussing one of the game's pioneers, John Thorne wrote that Lewis Van Wadsworth had been born in Litchfield County, Connecticut, to Amos and Amanda Wadsworth on May 6, 1825. The rest of Wadsworth's story is the topic of today's lecture. John Thorne is the official historian of Major League Baseball, a frequent contributor to the MLB Network and ESPN, and was the chief consultant to Ken Burns' uh, PBS series, Baseball. With our sports exhibit opening, he was a uh, natural to uh, throw out our first pitch of programming, and we are thrilled he is here. Let us welcome John Thorne. I stayed up late last night because I was tracking an auction that some of you may know about. It was at SCP Auctions based in California. And what was being auctioned were three documents from 1857, a year which will be profoundly important in today's talk, and in which Mr. Wadsworth figures. And I got tired and went to bed with these three documents at $1.9 million. Mm -hmm. When I woke up this morning, they were at $3.2 million, thus becoming the most valuable baseball documents in existence, surpassing the prior high of Babe Ruth's uh, 1920 contract, which went for one million and change, one million, 1.02, I think it was. So it tripled the previous um, champ, so I'm feeling pretty good about perhaps this uh, ushering in a renewed level of interest in the early game and my favorite century, which is the 19th. $3.2 million and they could have been yours. <laughs> they actually, somebody, some bright fellow picked them up uh, in 1999 at a Sotheby's auction, which was not a baseball auction, but a manu historical manuscripts auction, which there was no illustration and a weak description. And on a flyer, this guy who has more money than most of us, uh, coughed up $12,600. So I think his capital gain would be pretty nice. <laughs> Baseball, as they are titled, crafted for presentation by the Knickerbocker Baseball Club to the first convention of baseball clubs, we have tangible evidence of the genius of Daniel Lucius Doc Adams, a rediscovered hero who was the top vote getter among old timers on last year's ballot for the Baseball Hall of Fame. There were 16 voters, 12 votes were required for induction, Adams got 10. I thought it was a really great first showing for a man nobody had heard of 20 years ago. And why have people heard about him since? Well, I've had something to do with that. At the dawn of the 20th century, there's our boy Adam. Baseball's origins were already too old to be remembered. So stories were devised to rationalize what was otherwise baffling. Baseball history then was in the hands of folklorists, not historians. Members of the Mills Commission, also referred to as Albert Spaulding's Commission, for he formed it in 1905 to determine the true origin of the national pastime, lacked the mundane primary documents that typically aid historians of everyday life in the reconstruction of events. I will interpose here to say that it's really, for me, a fascinating but um, admittedly difficult thing to reconstruct how people played 200 years ago or longer, because typically this was not recorded, unless it was in the form of a prohibition or somebody having an eye put out by a bat. <laughs> Accordingly, the members of the commission looked to octogenarian reminiscences of events witnessed long ago, if at all. Thus, we were handed a pretty story of Abner Doubleday as baseball's inventor, supposedly in Cooperstown, one bright day in 1839. Uh, show of hands, who here believes that Doubleday invented baseball? Good. <laughs> <laughs> Doubleday, uh, you know, it said that uh, 
Abner Doubleday didn't invent baseball. Baseball invented Abner Doubleday. And he did not begin the game, but he did begin something else. He fired the first response in the first shot in response at Fort Sumter. Thus, it may be said that he started the Civil War. <laughs> Almost immediately upon the commission's naming the Civil War hero as baseball's dad, others came forward to declare the story a fable, insisting that instead it had begun in 1845 with another father figure, Alexander Cartwright, a teammate of Doc Adams on the Knickerbocker Baseball Club. Both men had gone to their graves not knowing that they had invented baseball. They died within a year of each other, one in 1892, one in 1893. I'm always mixing up the two. While Doubleday gave Cooperstown an excuse to establish a fine museum in an economically challenged upstate village, Cartwright, unlike Doubleday, was awarded a plaque in the Hall of Fame that credits him as having, quote, set bases 90 feet apart and, quote, established nine innings as a game and nine players as a team. This is demonstrably false, as none of these aspects of the game were settled until 1857, some eight years after Cartwright had left New York for Hawaii, never to return east. So the uh, plaque makers uh, for Cooperstown, I think, may be having some work shortly. In 1868, Henry Chadwick, the only writer inducted into the Hall of Fame, by that I mean he has a plaque in the Hall of Fame. There are writers who are honored annually with the Spink Award, but they do not get plaques. Chadwick wrote, our present national game is a great step in advance of the game of baseball as played in 1840 and up to 1857. Yes, 1857 was the year that baseball made its great leap forward and these are the documents that reveal what it was like to be present at the creation of a national institution. Adams was the guiding force. William Henry Grinnell rendered his teammates' draft into the presentation in fine Spencerian script that was placed before the convention. They were two of the three Knickerbocker Club delegates to the convention, which convened for its opening session on January 22, 1857. The third Nick member about whom so little was known for so long, but whose compelling story is the one that principally concerns us today. This photo of Wadsworth in Plainfield, New Jersey, possibly in Rockaway, New Jersey, or Denville, is about 1873-45. It's indistinct, but it is the only image we have of it. And I did not have this in my possession uh, at the time that Eden was published. So things continued to pour in. It was Wadsworth who stood up at the convention, which had just ratified the Knickerbocker <coughs> Club's preference for a game of seven innings, an outcome that was reported in the press, and turned the delegates around to his proposal of nine innings. Pretty good idea that Wadsworth may have been responsible for a great deal more in baseball's evolution, including the provision of a new diagram of the game and becoming the game's first professional player. We'll come in for discussion today, too. But it is his life story with mysterious details that did not yield themselves to me until after more than 20 years of digging. I, I researched Eden for 28 years. Now I wrote other books uh, along the way because my family has grown accustomed to eating. <laughs> but uh, the research was continuous and dogged, and in the case of Wadsworth, monumentally frustrating. Only when I was able to place his missing pieces into the jigsaw puzzles of baseball's origin did I write the book that was published five years ago as Baseball in the Garden of Eden, The Secret History of the Early Game. In the late 18th century, Berkshire County in Massachusetts, Eastern Dutchess County in New York, and Northern Litchfield County in Connecticut basically formed one community with travel up and down the Housatonic Valley so these areas could be considered cohesively one. 
The border between New York and Massachusetts had long been a matter of contention and was settled only in 1787, while the New York-Connecticut border dispute wore on until, and you're going to get sick of this year, 1857. <laughs> Ball play was rampant in the Housatonic Triangle. Pittsfield, in 1791, enacted a law that barred any game of wicket, cricket, baseball, bat ball, football, cats, fives, or any other game played with ball within 80 yards of a newly constructed meeting house and church. <laughs> it has come to be known as the Broken Window Bylaw. <laughs> this class was expensive. Of these games, baseball appears to have been the dominant game in Massachusetts, and wicket, the preferred game in Connecticut, though certainly both games were played in each state. Enter Lewis Fenn Wadsworth, born in, and there's contention, either Anemia, New York, where an elder brother had died in infancy in 1823, or Litchfield, or Hartford, by various accounts, including very confused obituaries, on or about or maybe precisely, May 6th, 1825. His father was Amos Coles Wadsworth, born in 1787 and buried here in Litchfield in 1850, where he had descended into boarding house poverty after having been a fairly well-to-do merchant and uh, having lived for a while in Michigan, but we'll get to that in a sec. Lewis's mother, Amanda Mann Wadsworth, had gone west to Michigan with Amos around 1845, and remained there in Allegan County's township of Owasso with her other surviving son, Charles Waldstein Wadsworth, a year older than Lewis. She lived until 1885, 35 years after the death of her husband. 